Sir. In 1997, Esquire magazine, a magazine about men for men, needed a cover model for their special edition, New American Heroes. They chose Mr. Rogers. Do you remember Mr. Rogers? Yeah. It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. Beautiful day for a neighbor. Mr. Rogers was a beautiful man who told profound truths in a simple way to everyone, four years old or 50. He had a real neighborhood, by the way. He lived in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where I live. This cover of Esquire had a picture of Mr. Rogers and his smile, and it said, can you say hero? And then it said, Mr. Rogers, especially now. Yeah. The beginning of every television show, Mr. Rogers did the same thing. He sang a song, he put on his sweater, he changed his shoes. It kind of could seem silly if you were too grown up to really understand. But that year, he took a trip to California and he met a grown up, not too grown up to understand, Coco the Gorilla, an amazing animal, famous for being totally eloquent with American Sign Language. And she liked to watch television. She watched the neighborhood. And on this day, in her neighborhood, Mr. Rogers showed up and she recognized it instantly. She wrapped him in a deep gorilla embrace. And then Mr. Rogers told the magazine writer the amazing thing that happened. She took off my shoes, Tom, he said. <coughs> a few days after that, Mr. Rogers went to the California home of a 14-year-old boy who had a bad case of cerebral palsy. He watched Mr. Rogers on television every day. He needed a computer to speak and sometimes, in moments of despair, he would tell his mom that maybe God didn't like his body. But he heard differently from Mr. Rogers on television every day. And on this day, Mr. Rogers was coming to his house and he was incredibly nervous. But Mr. Rogers was not coming to help this boy in the way that you might think. He said to the young man, I would like you to do something for me. Would you do something for me? The boy through the computer said yes. Nobody ever asked this boy to do something for them. Mr. Rogers leaned in and he said, would you pray for me? The boy that could not speak really could not speak, thunderstruck. The magazine writer later said to Mr. Rogers, you are so smart to sense that by asking him to pray for you, he would feel better about himself. And Mr. Rogers was very puzzled and he said, no. I, I didn't ask him to pray for me for his benefit. I knew that a young man like this, who's been through what he has, must be very close to God. I wanted his intercession. Intercession is a powerful word, so is intersection. I've long taught that a major key of life is paying attention at the intersections. Usually I'm talking about that metaphorically. Right now I'm talking about it physically. In the early 90s, I had just moved to Pittsburgh. I didn't really know my way around. I left the broadcast. I had to get to the airport. I was lost. I took a wrong turn. I was in downtown Pittsburgh. I, I saw an intersection and I knew if I made the right, hit the ramp, went across the bridge, through the tunnel, out to the highway, I might make it. And then the light turned yellow. There are moments of decision in all of our lives. <laughs> I gunned the engine and went for it. At the same time that the guy standing on the street corner decided to get a jump on his don't walk sign and he stepped into the intersection. I slammed on my brakes and everything froze. Some miracle I did not hit him. Inches. Our eyes locked through my windshield. His shock and my horror was Mr. Rogers. I almost killed Mr. Rogers. I would still be in jail. <laughs> but I'm here with you in uh, Flint, Michigan, where 25 years ago, I was a television news anchor here at Channel 5. I did the evening news. On, uh, I would anchor the news on the weekends, and during the week I would tell stories around mid-Michigan. Uh, my oldest son was born at uh, Saginaw uh, General. I have five kids. The youngest is five months old. I'm a real hero. Um, <laughs> I'm, I plan today to actually tell you about some of those stories from mid-Michigan. I was going to tell you about um, the 114-year-old lady I interviewed not far from here in Flint Township. She was raised on a farm in Tennessee where her grandparents had been slaves. Her family said, ask her about politics. Oh, so are you a Republican or a Democrat? She whispered to me, I'm a Republican. I said, 
why? She said, they set me free. Hard to argue with that. I was going to tell you about some heroes I've known, like my grandfather who joined the 101st Airborne and on D-Day as the troops were about to come ashore at Normandy, flew in a rickety glider to a rocky landing on the hillside behind enemy lines. I was going to tell you about his father who came from Finland to this country and about this Finnish word, sisu. What does it mean? Determination, bravery, resilience. Wikipedia says there's no actual translation, proper translation, into another language. For the Finns, it means a steadfast kind of courage that does not waver in the face of onslaught. Flint needs this Finnish word. I was going to tell you about the Finnish CrossFit star, Miko Sela, who inspired this shirt. I was going to tell you about the CrossFit workouts that we do. We call them workouts of the day, WADs. And the hardest ones are called hero WADs. Where we take a CrossFitter who's died in the line of duty in Iraq or Afghanistan or a firefighter or a police officer and we name the workout and we look at their picture and we read their bio and we grieve for their families and we take the exercises they did and we put our bodies through a hellish ordeal in physical solidarity to give meaning to their sacrifice. If you saw the movie Lone Survivor, you know the story of Michael Murphy. The first hero water CrossFit is called Murph. You run a mile, you do 100 pull-ups, you do 200 push-ups, you do 300 squats, you run another mile. If you're serious about it, you wear a 20-pound weight vest. This does not make you a hero if you do this. It gives you a tiny glimpse into the kind of character it takes to become one. I was going to tell you more of those stories, but something you heard in here yesterday made me change my speech. That's why I brought my notebook in case I forget something. I want to tell you about something that happened 20 years ago this month in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, a plane crashed. On a beautiful September night, a flight from Chicago suddenly turned and dove and everyone died, 132 people. I covered the crash for days. Four days later, I went and covered a live memorial in Market Square in downtown Pittsburgh. Everybody in Pittsburgh seemed to have a connection to somebody on the plane. I watched the people silently walk out of buildings and fill the square and the ceremony was very moving. Music and prayers and speeches. The Salvation Army commander who was in charge did something not on the schedule. In his jacket pocket he had a cassette tape. He planned to not play it, but at the last minute changed his mind. On the tape was a recording from a church service just a few days before the crash. A song sung by a young man who died when the plane went down. His name was Kirk Lynn. He worked for a bank in Pittsburgh. He'd been on a business trip to Chicago. He was a volunteer choir director at the First Evangelical Free Church in McKeesport, Pennsylvania, a town very much like Flint. He had told his fiance that he felt that God meant him to do more with his music and to reach more people. That was about to come true. On the tape, you could hear him tell the congregation to close their eyes as if in prayer. You can imagine that moment here right now and think of the stunningly beautiful tenor voice of this young man singing, storms may rise on seas unknown while we journey to our home. Surely we'll know what grace is for as we sail to heaven shore. They played this tape for thousands, and it hit like a tsunami wave of healing for a broken city. I've never seen people sob like that. As soon as it was over, I called the newsroom and I said, we need to get a crew down to that church. And that song could have been a footnote in a much larger story of loss and despair, but we fanned those flames, just journalists telling a story, and pretty soon people were hearing about it across the country. I was proud of my role in helping to fan those flames, but the story was about to get bigger for me. A day later, I was talking with an official at the college I attended outside of Chicago, Wheaton College, and I told her about the ceremony and about the young man and the song, and she said, it wasn't Kirk Lynn, was it? And I said, yes, and she said, well, he was a student here at Wheaton College when you were. Did you know him? I was stunned. I stepped back from my phone and my desk. I didn't know him, but I would soon feel like I did. I went to Wheaton two months later and at homecoming told a crowd of 2,000 the story of Kirk Lynn and the song and the healing that it brought to that town. A year later, a good friend of mine introduced me in D.C. to his soon-to-be fiancée. She was from Pittsburgh. She asked me about the plane crash, and I told her about the service and the young man and the song. She said, it wasn't Kirk Lynn, was it? I nodded. She grew up in McKeesport, sat next to Kirk Lynn in elementary school, and began to cry as I told her the story. A few years later, I was asked to speak at a prayer breakfast. I thought, you know what? It's been a couple years. I'm going to go, and I'm going to tell that Kirk Lynn story. That morning, I was reading the newspaper, and there was a letter to the editor from Kirk Lynn's mother. Of course there was. 
I tracked her down, I called the church, and they told me that in the months and years after the crash, they'd gotten 10,000, 1,000, 20,000, 30,000 requests. They'd sent out cassette copies to every state in the country. A young man who was dying of a brain tumor was at peace with that, planning his own funeral service said, I would like them to play this song at my funeral. A woman whose sister was in a coma from a car crash wanted to play that song at her bedside. I could tell you many more twists and serendipities in the Kirkland story, but I don't have time. But I have a hunch that I want to tell you about. When I was at Wheaton, Kirkland was three years behind me. One year behind him, a transfer student in his sophomore year, And I don't know if this transfer student knew Kirk Lynn, but I am really certain that he knew this story. The crash that killed Kirk Lynn happened just a few years after these young men graduated from Wheaton. Wheaton's a small school with devoted alumni. The story of Kirk Lynn was widely told and known. A young man with no expectation would get on a plane and suddenly die in a crash, but had this hope that he was meant for something more and his music would bring a message to a larger group. The transfer student, just a few years later, would also board a plane, also on a September day, and it would also crash near Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And that was the young man from right here in Flint, who in the moments that mattered said the words we remember, let's roll. My oldest daughter is a student at Wheaton, and every day she dines in a building named for Todd Beamer. Did he know Kirk Lynn's story? My hunch is that he did. And I'm here to tell you that the stories that we tell about heroes, great and small, quiet and bold, are among the greatest gifts we can give to each other. You've heard a lot of fantastic speakers the last two days. A year from now, I'm going to tell you, you might remember this point or that point, maybe not, but you're going to remember the stories. I'll think about a baby on a green carpet. You heard Dan yesterday talk about bringing that flag out of the Pentagon, and he said, your day of testing is going to come. Will you be ready? When your world collapses, when you see evil done in front of you, when you see evil done to you, you will need a deep reservoir of heroes and their stories to sustain you. Learn those stories. Learn to tell them well to yourself, to your family, and to others. It is what we have always done. From painting on cave walls to holograms on Disney stages, a story can be a song, a melody about a girl named Aziza. It can be 10,000 words. It can be two words. Jesus wept. Let's roll. Take the stories of the Hero Roundtable and make them known. The Hero Roundtables are the global events that ask the question, what is a hero? You've just seen one hero talk. To find more and join the conversation, visit our website or social media.